The scripture today is from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 25. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. When the church gatherings were suspended, I had wishful thinking that I would enjoy reading more books. Years ago, I really needed a Sabbath away from home and work, so I went to a self-guided silent retreat. For two full days, I did not talk to anyone, but ate, read, and walked alone at the retreat center by Lake Michigan. I kind of expected to be relaxed like that, 
laying around, reading and taking naps all day long. The reality turned out that I spent way more time reading articles, blogs and emails and watching many press conferences and the news and sometimes surfing on the Netflix. When the worship design team was brainstorming our current worship series, however, I immediately grabbed this small magazine that I used to subscribe for a number of years until it was discontinued. This wonderful quarterly publication by the Upper Room Ministry called Weavings, A Journey of the Christian Spiritual Life was my soul food and a well from which I could dig deeper into the questions of life. For the last three weeks, I reread this particular edition, which covered the subject of hope several times. Our lay servant Gary Gubnow delivered a meaningful message last week, and we heard about the dictionary definition of hope and various passages about the promise of Jesus that give us hope. There are so many beautiful articles, poems, and prayers in this magazine, and this description of Luther E. Smith, Jr., a professor from Candler School of Theology at Emory University, really spoke to me this time. He said, Hope is a force of God that enlivens us to life. Dr. Smith says that hope is more than an optimistic attitude or feeling of assurance. Like grace, love, and faith, he asserts that hope is a force transforming energy that comes to us from God. In today's scripture passage in Hebrews 10, the preacher, who is presumed as a female by some modern scholarships, and probably Priscilla, one of the leaders of the Pauline community in the early church, exalts that Jesus became the high priest who opened a pathway to access to God for us, like the curtain that was torn apart in the temple. He gave himself, his own body, his life, as a sacrifice of love for the redemption of God's covenant people. When we have this wonderful high priest, our reconciler and mediator to God, how should we live faithful? In verse 23, she encourages Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, those who were undergoing persecution, to hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. When I read the text in Eugene Pearson's translation, I could better understand what Dr. Smith had portrayed as hope. Pearson interpreted verse 23 like this, Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. One thing we can say about hope is that it is the power of God that keeps us moving and living in spite of all the hardships, the ordeals, and despair of life. And as Marilyn Chandler McIntyre says, it is in the person of Christ that hope is anchored. The promises emerges from the relationship 
we are invited to claim. In Jesus Christ, who has died, is risen, and will come again, we live and move and have our being. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness hides his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I participated in a webinar with the Reverend Adam Hamilton, the lead pastor of the Church of Resurrection, with other 230 clergy in our conference last week. As many of you know, he has written several books and he is the leader of our denomination. Currently, two small groups in our congregation are studying his book, Unafraid. I found out that Hamilton's church is doing a worship series under the same theme of hope in this Easter tide. Kudos to our worship design team. I think we are on the right track. Since we are on the same topic, I checked their last week's service and tried to get some inspiration from Adam Hamilton's message. Hamilton points out that Jesus did not talk about hope explicitly or use the word itself in the gospel. Why? Hamilton thinks not because this subject was unimportant to teach or talk about, but because of Jesus' life and ministry, as Jesus himself was the presence of hope to all the people he encountered and held a relationship with. Jesus was the incarnated hope to those who lost meaning, connection, dignity, and wholeness. Those who were living in despair and sorrow. And so we are, as the body of Christ, to be the presence of hope to the suffering world as Easter people, people who have received the gift of resurrection, the gift of new life. Whenever we share ourselves in a loving, kind, and compassionate and generous way, whenever we participate in the pain of others, whenever we stand up and speak for justice and mercy and stay with those people in solidarity, we become the presence of incarnated hope. As I conclude today's message, I'd like to share a video clip which cast Stanley Howard, a great contemporary theologian of our time. May the words of this sage bless our journey as we continue to explore our faith and live each day by this power, the enlivening force of our loving God. May we be the glimmers of hope where we are, where we belong. You are God's hope, people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
how do we learn to be hope in a world where there is no solutions? Um, well, first, to make sure and distinguish hope from optimism. <laughs> Um, hope um, is a virtue that um, draws on the presumption that you've been given gifts that you could not have anticipated to um, make you capable of being a presence in a world of despair um, to um, say the very fact that I'm here means all is not lost. So hope first and foremost is presence uh, and uh, we give our our bodies are hopeful just to the extent that uh, they make presence possible. It's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. Ah, uh, and same to you, Peggy. A lot of people miss you, and we all miss each other, our church family. And Peggy, your name was given to me that you have a good story, beautiful story to share about your mother, because today we honor all our mothers and mother figures in our life journey. So do you have a story to tell? Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I have a story, but I can tell you about my mother. Um, whomever told you that I had a story is probably because they met my mother. She would come and visit uh, during the summertime, and she'd always come to church with me. So uh, quite a few people there at church met her and, and know the person that she was. Mm. Um, she was the definition of kindness and caring. She spent her whole life doing for others. Um, and she had a little difficulty allowing others to care for her because she, she just doesn't, didn't think that she needed to be cared for. She was supposed to care for them. Mm. Um, that if, if there was any flaws, that was the only flaw she had. She taught Sunday school for 64 years. She started when I was an infant in the class that they called cradle row. Mm. And she just kind of moved up as I grew. And then after I was an adult, she continued to teach until about 2011 when she retired. She was um, 84 when she 
finally retired from teaching Sunday school. And uh, through all those years, she taught just about everybody in the congregation. So she was Miss Hazel. Um, anything that needed to be done, ask Miss Hazel because she'll take care of it. That, that, that was her reputation. She'll get it done. Anyway, she passed away 13 years ago. And um, I still think of her every day, and I'm still trying to live up to her example. She used to tell me, now, Peggy Jean, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Mm. I, I'm not sure I have honored that very well, but uh, I try to. What a wonderful, amazing story. Sounds like she's been nurturing many children and became a spiritual mother. Absolutely. Absolutely, she did. So thank you for sharing this story with us. And we give thanks to God for all the blessing and gifts we receive for Hazel's life. And hope you have a beautiful, wonderful Mother's Day. And blessings to you. Peace to you. Thank you, Peggy. See, see you soon. soon. Yes, see you soon. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. You wave. Happy Mother's Day. Love you, mothers. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Becoming life. 